In the decade following 2008 in the United States here, the share of people graduating with bachelor's degrees in humanities dropped by a third. So what's at play here and why does it matter? Andrew Del Banco is professor of American studies at Columbia University and the recipient of a National Humanities Medal from President Obama. He talks to Michelle Martin about the importance of reversing this decline in learning the humanities. Thanks, Christian. Professor Andrew Del Banco, thanks so much for talking with us. My pleasure. So the immediate impetus for our conversation is a recent New Yorker article by Nathan Heller. It's titled The End of the English Major. He starts with the study of English, but he kind of expands to sort of the humanities in general, saying that, you know, the study of English and history has fallen dramatically. And he says, well, that's, the, that's a problem. So like, what's your, what's your top line reaction to that? I think it's fair to say that the article is a little bit too bleak. That is, the numbers that he cites are, are sobering and they're accurate as far as they go. But if you're only looking at English majors, uh, you may get a different impression that if you also, also look at students who are minoring in English, and at students who are taking courses in English, but not necessarily majoring. Uh, so, uh, and, and there, there's also a significant oversight in the article, which is that he doesn't really speak about the uh, very large sector of higher education, which is the community colleges, where something like 40% of undergraduates attend, where the humanities uh, and the liberal arts are actually thriving. So the, the first thing I would say is let's, take this picture with a little bit of a grain of salt. But look, having said what I just said, there is certainly true that the humanities are in decline, that student interest in the humanities is, is falling rather than rising. So one wants to think about now, why might that be? And I, I think there's no single answer. Uh, one answer that I would propose is that we all instinctively know that reading, at least reading something longer, let's say than a tweet, does not occupy the central place in our culture that it that it once did. In my own teaching, I've been moving em emphatically toward asking students to read shorter works, novellas, stories, speeches, poems, and the like. Another factor in um, science or the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, where so many students are gravitating these days. Science is exciting. Science is about the future. Technology, which is the byproduct of science, uh, promises to help us solve the climate change problem. Some people even believe that uh, computer science, art, uh, artificial intelligence, will someday make human beings immortal. But from my point of view, it's perfectly reasonable to expect young people to be more interested in the future than in the past, which is fundamentally the subject of the humanities. Now, another reason, and this is a uh, a, a different kind of reason, is the place of money in our culture. Um, when I was an undergraduate, if someone in the dining hall had said, my uh, ambition is to become an investment banker, it would have been a conversation stopper. Today, it's the norm. It's understandable yeah. as colleges have opened their doors to a broader uh, demographic of students. Many students who are first-generation college students come from families for whom debt uh, is, a, is a serious challenge. It's perfectly reasonable that students are focused, sometimes single-mindedly, on studying something that they think is going to lead to a remunerative job and a career. And it's also the fact that the cost of a college education has escalated far beyond the rate of inflation, so it's not an idle concern. So there's that. Okay. So you've identified that there are certain trends that are moving away from people studying, you know, English and perhaps other humanities as a, as the, as their main focus while in college. Is this a problem? I'm committed to the proposition that yes, it is a problem. It's a problem for young people individually, and it's a problem for our society and its future. Young people still have an appetite indeed an urgent need, I think, for what the humanities have to offer. Young people, indeed all of us, grapple with questions every day to which there is no right answer. They grapple with questions in their own lives that are the subject of literature. For example, what's the difference between love and desire? 
a, a central theme in many of the great novels uh, of, of Europe and, and, and our own country. Um, what is my responsibility to myself as opposed to my responsibility to others? And how do I find the right balance? What is the shape of a meaningful life? What kind of a life do I want to, to live? And my, my sense is that students have those questions on their minds at least as much as ever before, maybe even more so, given all the stresses that they're under. And in fact, there's evidence that there are some uh, ways in which college is meeting that need. For example, at Yale, one of the most popular courses is the course on happiness. At Harvard, for many years, uh, there's been a popular course on the theme of justice. These are the fundamental, these are the core themes of the humanities. And frankly, one reason I think we're seeing this uh, stampede away from English departments, if that's the right word, is that English departments have not been stepping up and meeting this need as well as they could have done. They seem to expect that students will be interested in literary history or the theory of how to, how to read. And in some ways, English departments have been in a sort of weirdly hostile relationship to literature where these themes are, are to be found and explored. So what I'm trying to say is I think the appetite for the humanities is still there. The need for the humanities, that is, the value of confronting these questions with the help of a rich text, a good teacher, and your classmates who are grappling with the same question. That need is unabated, and I don't think it ever will abate. The question is whether our colleges and universities can meet that need, and I think there are ways for them to do so. There has been this sort of movement that, you know, dead white guys have nothing to, to teach us. And I just wonder if that that point of view, that the dead white guys, as it were, uh, have too big of a footprint in the literature and that there's something about that that's taken hold in a way that kind of the profession sort of eating itself. Does that, does that, could that be true? Well, first of all, um, English departments have spent a lot of, I think, unproductive time arguing about exactly which books by which kind of authors they should teach. There are powerful texts by dead white guys and by living writers of color and by women and by non-Western authors, old books and new books uh, and medium age books. Um, our problem is there are too many good books rather than uh, uh, the opposite. So, um, but yes, this sense that um, the subject of the English department is somehow a tradition that we should discard as oppressive and irrelevant is part of the problem. I don't think it's the core problem. And I think actually English professors are waking up to this problem and are moving more in the direction that I've been talking about. But it is a problem and perception becomes reality as we all know, if that's what students think. One among your many books uh, is a book about college, like what is college for, um, what, it, what it has been, what it could be. But one of the things that you've pointed out in your book is that these kind of hand-wringing about college and the quality of teaching, what are we teaching, is not new. But there does seem to be something something new here. I mean, if you look at the number of people who are enrolling in English departments in, in a number of these institutions, it really has fallen precipitously, at least in certain, some of these four-year universities that you that Nathan Hiller writes about in his piece. He talks about Harvard, but he also talks about Arizona State. So, so, so do you think this is kind of a particularly I don't know if I want to say precarious moment, but um, a particular moment where something really specific is going on here that it, we need it, to pay attention to. It, it is, absolutely. It's a particular moment when people who believe in the humanities need to step up and think in fresh ways about what it means to teach the humanities and whether it's really appropriate to worry so much about how many English majors there are. That's really, you know, I don't think that's a productive path to go down. I can't make a good argument in most cases for a young per person to choose an English major, unless they happen to aspire to a life as a college professor, which is uh, a risky bet. Um, but I can make a very good argument that they should read books and debate and discuss the themes of those books with their peers in a classroom with a sensitive and an interesting teacher. And um, I think we see evidence, that's where I really wanna say that this problem can be turned into an opportunity. We see evidence that at many institutions that do not make it into Mr. Heller's article, the faculty has woken up to the reality that they're, if they sit back and wait for the students to come to them, they're gonna be waiting a long time. What they need to do is get up and go to where the students are. 
And where the students are in most places is in the general education program, which is that sort of interval between arriving in college and choosing a major when students are asked to explore subjects with which they may not be familiar and which the institution thinks is important to them as, as adults and as citizens. So Purdue University, which is a very STEM-centric institution, the vast majority of students arrive there aspiring to become engineers or scientists of one kind or another. They got a new dean a few years ago who discovered that fewer than 10% of the students there were, had, had ever taken a literature class or even a history class. He said, this is not okay. He identified a magnetic and charismatic history professor named Melinda Zook, who went to the English department and to other humanities departments as well, and said something like, hi, colleagues, you may have noticed you don't have any students. Your classes are emptying out. Why don't you come with me over to the general education program? We're going to we're going to meet the new students, the 17-year-olds who are coming in or planning to become engineers. We're going to have a small class for them, and you're going to teach them what we're going to call transformative texts, not great books, not classics, but transformative texts by which they meant a text that has changed the world and retains the power to transform individual lives. That program began, and full disclosure, with a grant from the foundation over which I preside about five years ago with 60 students. Today, there are 4,000 students each year at Purdue voluntarily enrolling in those classes in their first year, what we used to call freshman year, in which they are reading, yes, some books by dead white males. They're reading The Odyssey by Homer. Why do they respond to that? Because every student is trying to figure out what kind of voyage they're on in their lives. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley because lots of students are concerned about the uses and abuses of technology. Can it take over from us? Uh, 1984, because lots of young people are worried about whether we're drifting toward totalitarianism in our society. These books are immensely popular. The students are having a powerful experience and a few of them will, yes, become English or philosophy or history majors, but not so many, and that's okay. They're having a humanities experience. I'm going to push you again on why this matters, because there are a lot of people who will listen to this conversation and be like, sorry, that's too bad. We need people to write code. We need people to do your back surgery when you get to that point. You know, look, you know, love y'all, but that's great. But that's, you know, literature is a hobby. It's not a, a job. And so this the society really needs people to do these other things. What, what do you say to them? Well, well, a couple of things. First of all, it's not an either or question. All the best doctors I've ever known have a, a, a humanistic interest. Uh, I've had some liberal education before they became uh, pre-med and then, and then scientific specialists. And I think that goes for creative scientists as well. In fact, I think one of the secrets of our country has been that our science has proceeded out of a sense of curiosity and adventure that you get from getting a liberal humanities oriented education. So it's not an either, either or. But more broadly, yes, we need all those specialists. We need all those competent people. We need experts in this and that. But we also need citizens, right? Those people are all citizens. They have to grapple with the tough questions like, where do I find the right balance between personal liberties and the public interest? The kind of question that we were dealing with during the COVID years. Um, how do I think about the nation state in a world where microbes and refugees from vicious regimes don't care about national borders, right? Those are hard questions. There are no right answers to those questions. And if we're going to have a functioning democracy where politicians can call to account when they talk nonsense about such questions, we need an educated citizenry. Democracy depends on that. So yeah, we need the technical training, but we need people who are capable of thinking about complex problems, listening to other points of view, and coming to a reasonable consensus about what's best moving forward. That's the fundamental case for the humanities. And um, whatever's going on with the enrollments in English departments, we cannot afford to lose the humanities in our colleges and universities. Are we relying too much on colleges and universities? Do you think that there are perhaps other places in society 
that should be stepping up to promote the humanities, reading, you know, English, ideas, history, and so forth. There surely are. Um, people are joining reading groups. People are participating in public events where they get to discuss these kinds of issues and hear thoughtful people talk about them. It's critically important that students get introduced to these opportunities in high school before they get to college. But I would say that there's something special about those years between, say, 17 and 20, roughly 21, where students, young people are sort of in that space between adolescence and adulthood, where they've achieved a measure of freedom, but not full freedom compared to when, where they were when they were living with their families. That's a very special time of life. It's a time of life when the kinds of issues that we've been talking about have a great intensity. They, they, they feel dangerous. They also feel exciting. So college is a really good place to promote the habits uh, of mind that I've been talking about. And while other places could be doing it too, uh, we don't want to lose sight of the centrality of these institutions. Are you worried about whether or not, as citizens, as a country, that people are absorbing the, the, the tools to make these kinds of decisions, to, to function as citizens in a way. I mean, the fact of the matter is, when it comes to things like, should we, you know, wear masks or not, and when, and if so, and when, like, you know, those are, those are the kinds of things where there isn't always one right answer. If you take the argument that, you, you know, a, a functional understanding of humanities, of English, of science, of history is necessary to that project, are you worried that we I, don't have it, that we're I, not getting it, we're not doing it? I'm very worried, but I'm also resolutely optimistic. I, I think in that little book that you kindly mentioned, I said something like, the college classroom is a rehearsal space for democracy. The college classroom is a place where we, we can't retreat into our ideological corners if the teacher doesn't let us. We have to be open to alternative points of view. We want to leave the room not sure that we have the right answer, but actually having doubts about the answer with which we came into the room that we were certain about. That's the place where you learn to be a participant in a democratic society. So I'm worried that we're not doing enough of it. People don't value it enough. But I'm optimistic that if we recommit to that aspect of what college is about, we can make a significant contribution to strengthening and maybe even saving our democracy. College is a powerful institution, and that's why it's so important. I think that everybody who wants to go to college should have the opportunity to do it in an affordable way. College is a place where you can figure out how you want to live in this messy, complicated, maddening democratic uh, culture that we have and that we have to do everything possible to, uh, uh, to maintain. Professor Andrew Vilbanko, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. I appreciate it very much.